The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to another episode of Speaking with the Senator. I'm Senator Kevin Avard, representing District 12 here in New Hampshire. And today we're going to be talking about energy again. And uh, we previously had a few people from the PUC. We had Don Priest from the uh, Consumer Advocate uh, and uh, a few other people that uh, talked about the RPS. And so now we have uh, another perspective here today. And we have invited uh, Mark Brown from the New England Ratepayers Association. You're actually the president of that, right, Mark? Yes, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks Pre for having me, sir. Appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, energy. You know, right. I, I, uh, before, we're not uh, two minutes into our conversation, I'm telling you how much I don't know about energy because it, it seems to be such a moving target, and there's so many interests and there's so many perspectives. Uh, you were there on some of our uh, meetings with the uh, study committees on transmission, distribution, generation, yep. RPS. Uh, but you have a perspective that uh, it's interesting. Um. I definitely do. <laughs> Good. We, we definitely do. Um, I don't even know where to start. One of the, the I guess, the, the main problems that's going on right now in New England is, you know, we have, we restructured about 20 years ago in New Hampshire. You know, we, we restructured to competitive markets. And uh, we don't really have competitive markets. You know, we've, we've there's been... It is a tacit re-regulation of the marketplace through whether it's renewable portfolio standards, you know, REGI, energy efficiency programs, all that has What is REGI? REGI is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. It's essentially, it's a cap and trade system, but it's essentially a tax on, on carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel generators. Now, the, the cost of REGI is already built into the rates, correct? Correct. And, and the, those rates are basically planned out three years in advance? That's the capacity market that's, that's planned out three years in advance. Uh, as far as the rates go, that's a day-ahead, real-time market. That's okay. So when, when somebody says, well, we need to pull out of Reggie, if, if New Hampshire pulled out of Reggie and all the other states continued to stay in Reggie, how would that affect New Hampshire? It would cost us money because we wouldn't get the rebates. Um, the way New Hampshire works is all of the allowance is above a dollar. So if, you know, the allowances, the carbon allowance, carbon dioxide allowances are $4, say. Mm -hmm. Anything above a dollar gets rebated back to customers. So, if we got out of Reggie, we would no longer get those rebates. We'd still be paying for it, because for the most part, every time a fossil fuel generator sets a marginal rate for power, right. you're paying. You know, you're paying that baked in. So, and the other states wouldn't mind us paying their their freight. Well, that that money would get redistributed. To, I assume. I don't really know. I guess to other states. No, but so, I interrupted you. You said Reggie. We, you know, we. Um, yeah, energy efficiency. Are, you know, any program that's you know kind of an out of market program mm -hmm. is you know uh, kind of goes against the idea of competitive markets. You can't really have both. I guess you know you can't have all of it. You see it now. You know. Uh, we have record low, right, wholesale energy rates. Uh, Why? Prices. Why are they so low? A few reasons. You know, natural gas prices are low. Mm -hmm. uh, demand has kind of steadied a little bit. Um, and you have a lot of out-of-market programs that, you know, reduce what's called the bid stack, you know, so it reduces the demand on the system. But there's still energy being, you know, rooftop solar is a good example. Massachusetts has almost 2,000 megawatts of rooftop solar. Wow. Or of solar. I don't want to say it's all rooftop. Um, but that's, for the most part, that's all out of market. So you could make a, a case that on certain days, you know, sunny day in, in June, it's 2,000 megawatts that would be, you know, in the competitive marketplace that isn't. Um, so, okay. you, you know, anything really that uh, is outside of the marketplace, you know, RPS is, is, out of, is out of market. They may bid into, you know, they may bid into the wholesale market, 
but they're also getting you know subsidies on the other side. They're probably bidding zero, you know, to take to be price taking. So whatever the clearing price is, because they're getting RECs. So you know what are RECs? Renewable energy certificates credits. You know, it's talked both ways, but it's a basically a premium price that's paid by ratepayers for certain classes of renewable energy in New Hampshire. And New Hampshire set the this the system up. Correct? It's not a federal program. And no, it's a state-by-state state program. There's a lot of states that have it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know the, the exact number, but many, many states over the, across the country have it. And every state in New England has it. So why do you think New Hampshire has some of the highest rates in, or in our grid is in the country? We're, what, the fifth highest in the, in the yeah, depending on Yeah, the, depending on the year and the month. And the, yeah, we're, we're the fifth highest in the country. Well, we have a lot of volatility in the market. So we, we, we talked earlier about um, the wholesale energy markets and how that's low. It's, right, it's low right now. Mm -hmm. Well, just a few years ago, it was pretty high. You know, it was, you know, instead of being at $26 a megawatt hour, it was up around $60 a megawatt hour. In 2008, prices were through the roof. I want to say they were you know, $85 a megawatt hour on average. I have to go back and look at that number. But, you know, so... It, 2012 prices tanked. 2013 they went back up. 2014 they went up. 15 they dropped a little bit. You know, 16 was real low. 17 is going to be pretty low again. So, but uh, what goes on in the wholesale markets doesn't necessarily re reflect what's going on in your retail, you know, in your retail prices. So while we may have you know $26 a megawatt hour prices on the wholesale market, you know we're paying you know. Uh, Five, six, seven, eight, nine cents a kilowatt hour. You know, right now my my competitive supply rate is almost nine cents a kilowatt hour, despite the fact that the wholesale energy market prices right now are around you know thirty bucks or lower. Well, as far as from you know year to date goes. One of the things that that's you three mentioned, times. That's three times. One of the things that you mentioned before we got on here, we were talking about uh, uh, there. There's what is called the default. Yep. Uh, there and uh, there are other suppliers. Basically, default is you move into a house and. Somebody turns on the electricity. Generally, people will just go with that. The, the utility, right? It's the it's the default. It's the utility. Right, but they, there's options that that people don't generally know about, and there are other facilities out there yeah. that will provide you energy at a cheaper rate. Yeah, they're called competitive suppliers, and Co you can go to yep. You can go to the PUC website, yep. uh, the New Hampshire PUC website, yep. and it has a link there where it will list all the competitive suppliers for you to choose from and the different rates and plans. That they have, and, and you can take some credit for that. Uh, yeah, we could take some credit for the the, the construction of the website, and um, you know some of the we made sure that there's notification now. What was happening for a while is competitive suppliers were at the end of a contract, they were switching to this variable rate, and a lot of times they were jacking up the rates kind of through the roof. It was really prevalent in Connecticut. Some of the competitive supplies in Connecticut were going kind of nuts. All right, you know, so you might have a, you might have signed a contract, say for ten cents a kilowatt hour for a year. And then the next thing you know, you know, contract ends. You're not really notified because they weren't really, you know, a process in place. Next thing you know, you're paying, you know, 25 cents. Yikes. Kilowatt hour. You know, so you know, we had people calling us from Connecticut saying their power bills went from $200 to $1,000. Do Do you represent all? We we look. We're we're all throughout New England. New England. Okay, I thought yeah, you were but just. I'm based in New Hampshire, so you know. You only have so much bandwidth, so you sure. know. <laughs> so I hear from, uh, you know, we went to a BIA uh, uh, event not, not too long ago, and you know, we had a manufacturer that was talking, uh, and he's saying, look, I, I can go to Georgia, or I can go to another state, uh, and, uh, you know, they're calling me. They, they want me down there, but I love New Hampshire. But for me to continue, I, I've got to lower my energy costs. And... I mean, he looked square at, my, at me, and I'm thinking, oh, God, I'm doing what I can, right? Uh, but it's very serious that yeah. they're, if you're going to run a manufacturing organization, a business, you, you know, if energy is one of the higher par parts of your, your decision making, uh, if, if, if it's half the price in another state and, and the labor is cheaper and if they got the people, you know, New Hampshire's going to be hurting. So... What do you say is the solution? How do, we, how do we get there from here? Well, you have to do what you can to lower. There's only so many things as a legislator that you can do. We're part of a regional energy market, right? right. So, you know, we're to some extent subject to the to whims and wants of others. But what can the feds do? 
what can the feds do? I don't think we want the feds setting energy policy for, for all of us. But they, they do do they do have some influence on, on some of our on transmission, transmission. and uh, natural gas, you know, uh, interstate pipelines, okay. transmission pipelines for natural gas. They FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory, Regulatory uh, Commission, generally oversees all of that sort of stuff. But that you know, that's a regulatory body. They work kind of I don't want to say hand in hand with ISO, but you know, ISO, ISO New England, independent yep. system operator, they kind of manage our grid. Uh, they kind of basically run by, you know, market proposals and what ISO wants to do from a market perspective, and FERC pretty much has to approve it. Right. So that's kind of how I actually visited it. It's a pretty uh, interesting facility. Yeah. ISO? Yeah. Over in Holyoke? Yeah. yeah. I've driven by it. Never yeah, been, been inside. It was kind of cool. You had to go through all kinds of security. We also uh, did a tour at the, uh, the nuclear power plant, uh, which was interesting, you know. A lot of lot of history there, you know, with with that. You know, if we had two towers, um, you know, then better than having one. Obviously, we have some power plants that are uh, being uh, or have basically gone by the wayside now. Uh, power plants, so. And that's you know that's one of the things to I think we need to be concerned about is, you know, when we talk about low wholesale power prices, right? We talk about market competition, and you know, we talk about merchant generators mm -hmm. you know, like Seabrook, you know, which is obviously a very large you know, 1290 megawatts. It's base load power. It runs 24-7. You can depend on it. You know, it refuels every 18 months. But other, I mean, you know, other than that, it's running 24-7. You know, that's it. Um, and I'm not sure Seabrook can survive you know, at $26 a megawatt hour. They, 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 according to them, they're doing the best that they can. They're, they're, uh, they're surviving, but it's, it's not. They're not making a killing. And you've seen it. You know, Vermont Yankee closed a few years ago right. in Vermont, and you know, from a from an emissions perspective, you know, uh, carbon dioxide emissions went up seven percent. You know, after Vermont Yankee closed, um, Pilgrim in Massachusetts, the new plant in Plymouth, is going to be closing in 2019, and uh, you know, there's another base load. 24-7 generator that's that's going to be leaving the marketplace. Basically, all we've had replacing, you know, the, these units in the in the from the capacity market perspective is uh, natural gas peaking units, so maybe some load following natural gas units, and maybe some renewables. But we're not getting, you know, I think footprint. There's a 700 uh, megawatt natural gas plant in Salem, Mass. I think that was the last uh, baseload generator really to, to clear the capacity. Market. So would um the Northern Pass be a baseload type of? Uh, yeah, Northern Pass is a baseload generator. And it's clean energy? It's clean and it's baseload. It's there when you need it. Right. Which is, you know, from our perspective, the, you know, important. There was another merchant uh, proposal or people were talking about that was actually a wind farm from, from uh, Maine, I guess. They were talking about uh, that would be able to provide a certain degree of pace. Base load too, but wind, wind seems to be intimate. wind cannot provide base load power. Right. That's absolutely not right. even close to true. It, it, it was sold that way. Terrestrial wind is probably in, in New England, probably in the area of twenty-five to thirty percent, which is called the capacity factor. I think they were going to add some some hydro with that though as well. So that, but it's hydro. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's what base. that's what's firm. But mm -hmm. here's the thing. So you're you're saying whoever it was, I, mean, I don't know which transmission company it was, but they're saying they're going to provide wind power with, with firm, you know, firm hydro. Well, okay. So you know your hydro's pretty much always there. So what are you doing with the wind power? You can't, you're going to shut off your hydro when the wind's running, you know, when the, when the wind's blowing, you're going to, you know, dam it up and, and release it, you know, it's not pump storage, you, know, you can't do that. So so why, why are so many people against the, the Northern Pass then? What, what is the problem? What is it, is it because you know, an extra hundred feet of, of line going through the, the mountains, uh, it, or it widening Look, it, the corridor. What, people don't want to see transmission towers. That's really what it. That's really what it comes down to. There, are, there are components of it that are out there, you know, who are worried about damming, you know, our border forests and all that sort of stuff. And there's also people that don't like the idea of, you know, it's a large project. It's going to uh, probably take away from solar and wind. Some, you know, so it's it's an, some of it's an ideological thing, but. So, you know, for some of it, they just don't want to see transmission towers. And there, there's another complaint, well, that it's just one big extension cord coming from Canada to, to Massachusetts. Yeah, the grid doesn't work that way. Um, electrons don't know where they're going to or from. Right. Um, 
you know, they just follow the path of, path of least resistance. So the, that would be that would be going on a transmission line. That's a transmission line, but it would but it would connect, you know, to the grid. Correct. And and one of the things that I understand is there are about four, maybe five billion dollars of new transmission charges coming our way in the next in the, in the future. I, I I don't know. That's that's my understanding. But is that from a reliability standpoint, or is that from you know for I, it'll take millions of dollars to connect transmission. I mean, billions of dollars, excuse me, to connect transmission lines to northern Maine to bring in wind power from northern Maine. So is that what we're talking about? No. Well, the positive part of this is is that Massachusetts will pay for these lines, and we will not have to. That's the, be the New Hampshire will benefit from Northern Pass. Look, Massachusetts wound itself up into a mess. Okay, it, 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 in two thousand eight, it passed what's called the Global Warming Solutions Act. And that requires that it uh, reduces emissions by 20% from like the 1990 baseload numbers by, I think it's 2020. And then it has to reduce by 80% by 2050 or something and like that. And that's driving up their costs. And Well, it's, it's, not, it's not only driving up their costs, but it's putting them in a predicament where that's a, that's a mandate. Like, there, there's a Supreme Judicial Court came down and said, no, that's not just a guideline. You have to, you have to do this. So that's why you have this clean energy RFP that, you know, a lot of people are, are upset about. And some people are, you know, you know, bidding into Northern Pass and some of the other hydro projects are bidding into that. So um, we think, look, the best thing is for Massachusetts to choose the project that's going to lower cost the most. Um, uh, my guess is that project's going to be the one that doesn't have an intermittent, you know, isn't intermittent and, you know, that sort of thing. So... So there are some people that say that we, we basically are uh, an exporter of energy here in New Hampshire. I'm hearing that from people. And, and there, there, many people are saying, well, why can't we just keep our own energy and, and get out of the grid? We could. We could. You know, we would have to re-regulate our utilities. We would have to, they would have to go out and either build generation or through bilateral contracts, pure power. Um, there's some people that think that might not be a bad thing, you know, but I think, it, look, if you were to do that, you would have to get rid of all the other programs, you know, in order for it to be cost effective. You couldn't have RPS and system benefit charges and all this stuff. I'm not saying you get rid of low income programs, you know, low income programs can probably be provided through another mechanism, either mm -hmm. taxes or, you know, low income people need, need help and they deserve it. Um, but all the other stuff, you know, you'd have to make a decision. You, know, you can't. Again, you can't have it. You can't have it all. You can't have support renewable. You know all the renewables, all the subsidies that go along with them, and then get low. You know low prices. The likelihood you know, of that happening, though, is pretty pretty. It's probably very. It's very highly unlikely. Yeah, I think. And I'm not advocating for it. I'm <laughs> yeah. just saying that there's some. You know, look, we're seeing results in the wholesale energy markets from competition. What we're not seeing that is that translating that into our into our bills home and in, in, in the business, in and, our business. And that, and the reason for that specifically is because of the renewables or? It's, no, it's not just, it's, it's not just, you know, it's not just renewables. You know, we don't have, one of the problems we have is even though we do have low wholesale prices, you know, in 2016, 2017, they've been relatively low. And like I told you earlier, 2015, 2014, winter of 2013, they weren't. You know, they were very high because we don't have adequate pipelines you know, capacity to meet demand in the winter time. The winter time when it's cold, it was local distribution companies which provide heat, you know, natural gas heat mm -hmm. to your home. They're the ones that have all the contracts for natural gas. Uh, there's, there's very few natural gas generators that subscribe to what's called firm capacity, basically saying, hey, you know, I'll, I'm going to take X amount of gas, you know, every day. So when it's cold, all those local distribution companies they own the gas. They're providing it to natural gas customers for home heating fuel. And then whatever's left over goes to the generators to produce power. Well, you know, we've seen natural gas prices. You know, right now, I'm pricing natural gas is probably $4 an MABTU right now. And we've seen it go up to, I think it was $40, $50 an MABTU a few winters ago. Electricity prices spiked to $2,000. $2, and they held at, you know, $200. $200 megawatt hour for a pretty good period of time and we had 
months where we had, I want to say, $150, $160 a megawatt hour was what we paid for power. So there's that part of it, too. You know? That's where the volatility comes in. And if you're a business that's seasonal and you're on the real time, you know, you're on real time pricing, and you're purchasing that power in the wintertime, it hurts. So I, <laughs> I asked Senator Bradley, so what's the silver bullet? There is none. Exactly. And that's exactly what he said. There, it's there impo is and that's what everybody wants, right? You hear the opponents of Northern Pass say, well, it's only going to lower electricity rates by a few pennies, a few dollars, whatever it is. Lower, lower is better. You're not, you can't come in here with one project that suddenly, you know, I guess, you know, and, and there are just, a lot of pieces it's going to this it's gonna cut your electricity bill in half. There's a, there's a lot to it. Mm -hmm. you know? um, it would provide certain jobs in, in certain areas. I know Franklin would benefit with jobs as far as if the Northern Pass came through. Uh, we tend to look at things as, will they lower rates or will they raise rates? Right. It's pretty black and white. That, that's, what your, that's what your focus is. That's what, yeah. And jobs generally will, will come from that. Like you said, you, know, you had a manufacturer talk to you about higher electricity rates. For any business owner, there's a tipping point. Okay. Right. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, it, there's no one thing, right? It's not just energy costs. It's not just labor costs. It's not just health care costs. It's not just taxes. It's all of those things combined. And once, once it tips the scales the wrong way, they either go out of business or they're out of here. Right. right. Well, so far we haven't uh, had a, a we've, everything's been pretty mild right now. So <laughs> keep the warm weather coming. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think we can depend on warm weather. No, no, I know that. Forever. Uh, so, how would you suggest people? What, what can pe average citizens do to to, to lower their costs? I mean, well, you should look at you know you should do your homework, look for competitive supply options, see what's out there, um, and you should advocate you know for policies that will reduce reduce your costs. You know, um, one of the funny things is you hear about you know renewable energy. Right? You talk to an aggregator, someone who goes out and you know resells power to people. They'll tell you. People aren't buying green energy. They're buying the least expensive power they can get. Mm -hmm. So when you hear how people support green energy, we, of course everybody does. Everybody likes you know, renewable energy. But nobody wants to pay more for it. You know, when it's cost effective, that's what, what people will choose. But people aren't going out paying more for green energy. Some, I say, you know, there's obviously some people that do. But right. the, majority, the vast majority of people are buying power, especially businesses, are buying it as cheap as they can get. Uh, so we had Don Crease on here, and, yeah. and we, uh, we, we we talked a little bit about um, uh, megawatts, energy efficiency, energy efficiency, and of course he's he's definitely advocating for that, and I, I think he's very uh, passionate about that. I, I think he is very, and 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 you know, there there there's got to be a, a a level of well, yeah, we can save energy, we can be more efficient. Nobody can disagree with that. I think it's hard to, but where is where is that uh, tipping point where you know? Well, I, the, if, they, if you go too energy efficient, uh, and will that drive up costs? Or uh, he's saying that the more that you invest in energy efficiency, the you're basically um, you're saving uh, three cents three for cent every cent that you Correct. invested. Is that was what you hear? Right. And that might be true for the person that's receiving the investment and the subsidy. There's really no evidence that shows that okay. you know, in real, uh, when you do the math, not modeled. You know, economic models can show a lot of things. All you do you have to do is jigger the inputs and you get different outputs. But when you look at path, that, you know, what we've spent in the past on energy efficiency, it doesn't really lower costs for everybody. So it lowers costs for the individual benefiting. It doesn't, there's no... Look, you're raising costs. The system's benefit charge going up is going to raise costs. And I can't remember the number. I want to say 80 million over a period, the, the three year period or something like that. It's going to raise costs. So that. And there's a lot of debate over that. So, what are the well, benefits to the system benefits? You know, they, we hear some, there were some people in the committee talking <laughs> about the benefits, and, uh, and then there are people that are talking about the cost. And so, uh, I, I, I really want the viewers to, to see what's going on. When, when we're up there and we're talking about energy, uh, there's passion there's on all sides of, of, of these issues, and uh, and you have to sift through that. You do, and and again, you know, um, there was a study done by the University of Chicago, and I want to say Cal Berkeley, but I don't want to get that wrong. Maybe MIT as well. But they looked at the, the Michigan 
a weather assistance program, low income weatherization program. And it wasn't modeled. They looked at you know, real numbers, real results, real costs. And they found that there was basically a, you know, a negative 9.5% return on investment from those programs. They're not producing you know, the results for, for you know, the general population. That would be contrary to what, say, Don. It, it would be contrary. And that's, you know, that's one study, you know, and that's isolated. But to my knowledge, that's the only study that's been done using real-world data and not some economic model that you know, has a lot of you know, maybe external you know, uh, factors in the calculations. That so if people want to learn more about energy and they want to learn more about uh, the Ratepayers uh, Association, how do they get in touch with you? How do they find... Uh, they can go to our website, www.anyratepayers.org, and they, you know, there's a phone number there to reach me at. And I'm more than happy to... You know, we get calls all the time to people that just want to understand a policy. You know, here's the thing. You talk to 100 people, one, two of them might understand you know, anything about renewable portfolio standards or a REGI or anything like that. So you can you can guide people as to what, what what's going on if, if, as far as policies concerned. I, I, you talk to municipalities at all? Do you do you yeah. engage with them? Yep, we do. Yeah, and and what does a typical conversation go like? Uh, well, here's you know you'll hear a municipality say, well you know we want to put so you know a lot of times it's we want to put solar here or something like that. And the truth is, look, that's great. You know, for that municipality, it's probably going to work out. You know, they get a lot of whether it's you know rural energy fund credits or they're able to net meter it. You know that sort of thing, and you know what net metering is is when you sell the power back, you know, back at, into the at, into at a the retail grid, rate. at a retail rate. You know, the, it's retail minus you know seventy five percent of default right now. So, I mean, of uh, distribution charges, they the recent ruling by the PUC basically cut the distribution charge by seventy five percent, which is roughly three cents. And that's called a tariff. That's part of the yeah the net metering tariff. Okay, right. But so yeah, so for them it's economic, but they have to realize everybody else is paying for that. Everybody else is paying through renewable energy credits for that, or through the renewable energy fund, or through tax, and that's tax cost credits shifting. or tax. And that's that's where the cost shifting comes in. And you know, I, would you support a policy uh, that would not allow the cost shifting? If the yeah, we would. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to you know whatever you're proposing, I have to take a look at it. <laughs> yeah. But if it's if it's at you know market rate, you know. Wholesale market rates, or you know, close to it at least. Whatever you don't use and goes back into the electric universe, if you will. Yeah, but you have to realize that when you're doing that, what you're also doing is you're creating that problem that I talked about earlier with out of market, right? You know, and you're artificially suppressing the wholesale market prices. You know. So look, I, I think, Senator, what it comes down to is we have to decide what we want to do. Right. You know, if we want to really lower electricity rates, then you know you've got to reform renewable portfolio standards. That's one of the drivers of the, one of the things that, as a legislator, you can control. You don't have to get rid of them. You can do what Maine does, and you know, Maine has no classes. Okay? They don't have little carve outs for solar or wind or biomass. And we have four classes, right? We now. have four classes, and every you know everybody has their own little piece, and we even have a thermal through electricity rates, which I'm not sure how that ever got in there, but um, seems kind of wrong. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, so but. You know, we could get rid of the classes, and that would put more competition into the rec market. It would drive down the rec prices, lower prices to consumers, and we would still have you know, a renewable portfolio standard. You know, personally, we, you know, as an organization, we like to see it go away because it, you know, it's it's a driving cost. But and uh, and for another conversation, and maybe we'll have you on with Don uh, Chris. Maybe we can happy have... to happy to come on with Don. By the way, you two are good friends, right? I, I love Don. I think he's a great guy. Well, uh, again, what's the name of your website? www.anyratepayers.org. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks I really appreciate it. Me. All right. And uh, again, we'll be having uh, probably some Eversource and some other people coming on the show to talk about energy. It's important, and uh, it's, it's important for you to focus to understand uh, some of the conversations that are going on uh, from all perspectives. So until next week, thanks for watching. Speaking with the Senator.
preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.